thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm pleased to uh, uh, make this presentation on, be on behalf of uh, my colleagues who uh, are acknowledged uh, in the next slide. So our uh, our work largely involves uh, two uh, two kind of studies. The first one is uh, to evaluate. Uh, the traditional and complementary medicines, uh, and, and also looking at the con uh, conventional medicine that are used concurrently uh, with uh, the um, uh, uh, herbal medicine, uh, especially in the non-communicable uh, non diseases uh, uh, in Malawi. And uh, there is a, a, a second uh, a project which uh, we termed it when we started. Uh, we termed it Malawi Aristocracy Project Map. And the, uh, this was the, as a result of the discussions that we, have, we had uh, with uh, Stephen uh, uh, Governor. Uh, and the, later on, uh, as I will present uh, this pro project, uh, we it expanded uh, to include uh, our neighboring country, that is uh, Zambia. So we have uh, some samples that were collected from Zambia. Uh, and at, at this stage, I need uh, to, uh, to uh, compliment uh, uh, Dr. Nicholas Whitman, who facilitated uh, that kind of work uh, to be done. And the, at the same time, uh, there were several uh, individuals who uh, participated in uh, one way or the other. Uh, those are the names uh, of uh, the persons uh, that participated in this uh, in this study, and I would like to acknowledge uh, 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 these people. At the same time, I would like to acknowledge the uh, the contribution or the support that we had or received from uh, Botanical Safety uh, Consortium and also from uh, HESI. Uh, 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 both the technical and also uh, the financial support that uh, made it to the realization of uh, the work that I'm going to present. So the first, uh, the first presentation will focus on the uh, herb drug interactions that uh, we conducted. So uh, there was a paper that was published uh, sometime in the, uh, 2018. Uh, or, or 2017, they about, which indicated that uh, uh, there is a, a high a kind of trade or marketing uh, involved in the traditional medicine in Malawi. And uh, in, in this case, uh, there were several uh, plants or plant species which were elucidated. And uh, this is in light with the, uh, the view that 60% uh, of the population, particularly in the Sub-Saharan Africa, they use uh, traditional medicine or con con uh, contemporary medicine uh, in, their, uh, as, uh, uh, in their health support. Uh, when it comes to Malawi, uh, there was, of course, we have developed in, in, uh, a standard uh, treatment guidelines. Uh, we developed them in 2015. Uh, unlike the 2015 uh, Malawi standard treatment guidelines, okay, before, before that uh, guideline, the, the previous one uh, focused a lot on the uh, medicine it was largely medicine-oriented kind of intervention, but the, the current one looks at uh, patient-centered, it's like a patient-centered kind of intervention. So to this end, we would look at holistically, what are the patients that, uh, are taking? Uh, they may not be necessarily in medicine alone. They could be uh, uh, they could be alternative medicines or con con uh, complementary medicines. Therefore, we need to look at uh, uh, such kind of issues. Uh, as much as we are trying to imp improve the access to medicine uh, for treatment of uh, high blood pressure and also looking at diabetes, we have to take uh, cognizance of the fact that uh, these patients may not only take the conventional medicine, but they can also look at uh, uh, alternative medicines. Therefore, this is why uh, we have uh, this project, which is uh, a botanical uh, 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 drug interaction or drug uh, drug help interaction. And the, the background to this, as I indicated earlier on, to say that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, about 60% uh, of uh, 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 the population relies on the uh, herbal medicine. But in Malawi, that percentage is a little bit higher. It's about 80%. So with that, we also observe that uh, there is an increase in the, the non-communicable diseases. 
and uh, this has come with uh, the associated uh, uh, the, uh, the associated uh, uh, focus where people in, uh, in addition to uh, to the to the drugs they also take uh, uh, the herbs in, in order to uh, to manage uh, uh, various ncds Therefore, we conducted this uh, a, an exploratory study where we wanted to investigate the potential botanical drug and also looking at the, the adverse reactions that are associated with the, the concurrent use uh, uh, among uh, among out, outpatients uh, outpatients that are at uh, Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital uh, in Atlanta. We should mention here that this Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital is a referral hospital where it attracts uh, patients from uh, even rural areas. So we have rural areas, urban areas, and also the peri-urban areas. They also uh, participate or, or uh, look at uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, hospital. Therefore, we, we had uh, the following objectives. The, uh, the first one was to gather self-reported adverse reaction data. Then we also wanted to explore uh, the prevalence of the use of uh, uh, the concurrent use of uh, uh, botanical and also conventional medicine. Then we also wanted to classify herbal medicines and their, their disease uh, states uh, for which they are used for. Uh, uh, for. In this regard, we uh, conducted the cross-sectional survey amongst the outpatients. Uh, this was conducted some two years ago, and in this case, we reached out to 300 and, uh, 302 uh, uh, patients, and we, ha we had uh, some uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, for these uh, participants that were enrolled. Uh, in this uh, study. We captured uh, demographic information, cl uh, cl uh, clinical information about hi hypertension and also diabetes. Then uh, we we'll also looked at uh, the type of medicines and also uh, 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 botanical products that uh, they use to manage uh, their uh, diseases. Uh, in this case, we the majority of, uh, uh, the, majority of uh, the respondents or participants were female. Uh, and the, the, most of them were aged between 46 and uh, 55, and the, the majority uh, came from the peri-urban uh, areas. Uh, in this case, if you look at uh, the, the type of, uh, if you look at the, uh, the conventional medicine, the, uh, the most important one was the metformin, of course, uh, that is used for diabetes, and we had the others who were taking uh, ins insulin, and uh, also when we look at uh, the, the botanicals, we had several uh, botanicals, for example, ginger, uh, garlic, uh, okra, moringa, and I will isolate these uh, in the later discussions to see how uh, they could uh, potentially affect uh, or contribute to the hep drug interactions. Then if you look at uh, the kind of uh, data that we, we, we looked at, they are quite, uh, okay, so there could be uh, several kind of permutations. There were various permutations that we were, were uh, trying to look at. The, uh, we are looking at drug, uh, drug help interaction or drug drug interaction or even help help uh, interaction could be realized. And uh, our our results showed that uh, most of the people uh, took or most of the participants took uh, a combined uh, kind of help, uh, helps and drugs. Uh, for example, it could be uh, participants were taking even on average, let's say, uh, six kind of uh, helps. Uh, so it was not only one help, but they could have uh, uh, several kind of helps taking uh, in, in combination with the, uh, uh, with the drugs that uh, uh, they use for, uh, for treatment or for management of uh, their diseases. Now, in this case, if we look at, we evaluate the botanical co uh, occurrences with metformin, uh, as I indicated earlier on to say metformin was the most uh, highly or, uh, or predominant, uh, predominantly uh, used. Then we we'll isolate uh, this uh, sausage tree, uh, moringa, and also the, uh, the okra, which was also mentioned uh, quite significantly. And uh, I will also mention about, uh, of course, uh, it is a small but very critical 
a minority of respondents uh, which were taking uh, aristocratic aristro uh, 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 species, uh, which will lead into the second presentation that I'll make. So we should just take note of that and see how uh, it progresses. Now, in this case, if we look at the, uh, the Moringa Orifera, which was mentioned, we, there is no, okay, in, in terms of uh, uh, green cost studies, uh, very little has been done to, uh, okay, so to demonstrate the effects of this, uh, or even the Moringa Orifera or the uh, diabetic treatment. Of course, we have some to, uh, toxicity studies which were evaluated uh, or were reported, and the, uh, the aqueous and also ethyl leaf extracts of uh, especially Kigeria Africana. They, sh they showed some significant uh, uh, blood glucose lowering effect uh, when uh, it was uh, administered to mice or rats. And also the same observations were uh, realized or reported when we used, uh, uh, when, they, when they used Moringa orifera. Then later on, if we also look at uh, the okra, which we, we also found that the, the majority of uh, I mean, participants uh, took them, we also found that, okay, so there's a paper uh, that was published in 2011, which also looked at uh, uh, the experimental rats. So when uh, this was administered to experimental rats, it, uh, the, the paper concluded that there, uh, indeed, uh, okra had some beneficial effects in the reducing uh, uh, serum uh, glucose, but at the same time, we find uh, they found out that even metformin would also, uh, I mean, act on the same kind of with the same kind of uh, uh, mode of action. Therefore, they have, they concluded that uh, uh, if uh, patients would take okra uh, concurrently with metformin, then the efficacy or the activity of metformin would be lost somehow. Uh, this was uh, reported by Cartoon HR uh, 2011. So these are the issues that we feel that uh, should be highlighted. Uh, therefore, the next step for this pro project is that uh, uh, we have constituted a team uh, which is working on the uh, draft manuscript. In fact, we have shared the, the draft manuscript with uh, uh, the team, and uh, the team is making some contributions. And we, we also feel that we should be able to explore the preclinical and also clinical pharmacokinetics and ph pharmacodynamics, of course, bearing in mind with the, the discussion that uh, uh, Cynthia uh, earlier on mentioned to say that uh, uh, BSC is not uh, doing uh, is not doing uh, 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 those kind of studies, but at least if we are to explore such kind of work, this would be very meaningful uh, uh, as a way forward for uh, the botanical uh, 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 botanical uh, dr botanical drug interaction study. Then I will present the uh, the Aristro Rock project that I mentioned earlier on. This was after the conversation that we had with uh, Stefan, as I indicated earlier on. So it resulted in the conceptualization of uh, this uh, uh, study. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, research has shown that uh, this uh, Aristropia, uh, it has uh, uh, 11 species, and uh, it, uh, we, we find that this genus uh, is very rich in the uh, acids. Uh, and also the aristocratic lactams. Uh, of course, they are bitter lactams. Now, if we look at the AA, they are quite uh, associated with the uh, lino kind of uh, toxicity. And uh, this kind of information to say, uh, if you remember very well, I indicated that five, five of 302 uh, uh, patients reported that they check uh, uh, these plants. Uh, in the combination with uh, their normal or uh, their normal drugs, so in this case, we we felt that uh, we, it would be important for us to evaluate that because even aristocracy, especially Hokai and also Hepai, they, they are used uh, for treatment of uh, traditional malaria and also other uh, drugs. Uh, in our study, we we also looked at uh, the plant is also used for uh, uh, to adulterate uh, other kind of uh, uh, compounds. 
So the question that we, we wanted to, uh, to ask, I mean, to answer was, is uh, the Arostroke Hawkai safe to consume? So, but unfortunately, we don't have any information that is related to that. Therefore, we wanted to uh, characterize the malawian grown Arostroke species with the view of understanding the potential risk that is associated with its use. Uh, in this regard, we wanted to procure uh, Arostroke Hawkai because this is what uh, came out in the paper. Unfortunately, after going through with the, uh, our, bot our botanists, we did not find the Hokai in Malawi. We found Abida and also uh, 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 other type of, uh, uh, of uh, the species. But the, the Hokai that we were looking for, we did not find it. Therefore, we. Uh, we we looked at the other kind of uh, we reached out to Zambia where they found a Hokai and also they find uh, they found a, a happy. Therefore, I will look at uh, the uh, the data that we have generated so far. So we looked at uh, two uh, two acids. In this case, we looked at aristocratic acids one and two. So if you look at those structures, in fact, uh, the difference is only the methoxy. Uh, group that is uh, uh, attached on that position there, and uh, this would lead into a uh, different kind of uh, uh, polarity. Hence, we could get a different kind of retention times. So, uh, retention times for uh, AA1 and AA2, as shown in this uh, in this graph here. So, we run the standard, and thereafter we run. Uh, in fact, we, we had a bit of roots and also leaves. But I will not present the results for the leaves. I'll only concentrate on the uh, on the roots. Now, in in, in this in these graphs, if you look at uh, uh, it is an overlay. So for the actual plants, the roots is uh, the one that is uh, 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 on the background, while on, uh, the one that is in the blue one is uh, for the standard. So if you can look at that, it matches very well with the, uh, the uh, I mean, the, the compounds that we are looking for of our interest, look at that and that. So they they overlay on the retention time. Uh, now in Malawi, the samples were collected from three districts. So we had Choro, Plantae, and Chikawa. These ones, they are, they have, even though they look very close, but they have different kind of uh, uh, ecological. They belong to different kind of ecological zones. And the, for the uh, for Zambia, they had two districts, uh, two, uh, two districts, that's Kafue and the Kalumbira. So the, the one that is Kafue is very close to uh, the capital city of Zambia, that's Lusaka, while that one is very, it's on the northwest. Now, if we, why we are concentrated on the uh, these two AA one and AA two is that uh, these are the most abundant uh, astro astrological acids, and also uh, it is reported that the AA one has been uh, has more uh, genotoxic and uh, nef uh, nephrotoxic effects than uh, AA two. Now, what 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 contents did we uh, realize? Uh, in all samples, if you look at that, in all samples. AA1 had the, uh, was greater in content than AA2. For example, if you look at uh, the samples that were obtained from Chikwawa, that is Malawi, this was the uh, Abida. Uh, the one that is in blue is the concentration of AA1. Uh, the one that is in, in gold, is it gold? If you are a color bright person like me, I would look at it as, as, uh, as brown, but I think it's gold. Now, that one is the one that is for a, a two. So generally, uh, in all the samples, we found that uh, we found that uh, uh, a, a, a one had the high concentration. So, if looking at uh, this this data, we uh, we we would like to confirm. We want to confirm the, uh, this results because we, we are doing this with the HPLC MS, uh, not, not, not MS, HPLC analysis. So we were uh, relying on the, the absorption. So if you look at, uh, at the, there could be some things which may not be uh, aristocratic, uh, 
assets, uh, for example, a in this under this one. So for us, just to rely on our data on the HPLC, we felt that maybe we should confirm uh, the results with uh, an MSMS uh, kind of analysis, which we intend to do at the Malawi Bureau of Standards because we don't have uh, that kind of equipment at, at our institution. Uh, later on, we want to publish these results in the peer review uh, paper. And there is also maybe it's, it's important that we can develop an outreach or an education program so that we sensitize uh, individuals or individual communities on the uh, hazards of cons uh, cons uh, consuming uh, these ar aristocrats as species. Then we can also maybe explore because we looked at, at, at Malawi, we looked at Zambia. We, we feel that in this region, maybe there could be other countries which may also uh, have uh, the same kind of uh, uh, problems that we are, we are anticipating in Malawi and Zambia. Uh, so I would uh, like to thank uh, the BSC and the HES uh, for the contribution that uh, they have made to uh, this project. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, KK. I really, uh, really appreciate it. It was really exciting because I know that data for those different Rissolokia species is uh, brand new. So it was really great to see that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Stefan Fuller, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I do. I I also uh, put a put a comment in the chat. <clears throat> and I mean, first of all, a great presentation and congratulations. I mean, um, I, I mean, we had, I think, seen seen the initial piece about two years ago in the, in the HESI board, and, and really great to see the follow through on the on the aristolytic assay work. So, I mean, this is highly highly relevant since these aristolytic acids are, are really highly carcinogenic. And I mean, I, I just just a thought here because I mean, and, and maybe a little bit of a a plug for. For the presentation of the gene talks team later i think some of the in vitro methods we are using like 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 we have done actually at Brock and gamble for the pas as, as presented by catherine could also be used to more directly check uh, certain plants certain extracts right and, and see how potent they are versus others to really at a minimum you know uh, make sure the, the worst ones kind of there's a way to regulate them and, and get them off the market. Because, I mean, that's the problem with that endpoint with, with genotoxicity and cancer. You, you see the acute effects. You don't see uh, cancer. You don't see gene tox until it's too late. And then it's sometimes very difficult to correlate with the exposure. So I think very, very highly relevant. Thanks again for that. Thank you, Stefan. And I, I think that's one of the things that we saw in the, the survey part that KK presented is that oftentimes we have people that are taking something and we definitely, most definitely do not know which Aristolochia species. And the analytical is, is quite labor intensive and expensive. So if there are methods that might be able to be used to actually screen products that are on the market where we don't know the species and we don't maybe have the ability to do the analytical, that might be very valuable. So thanks for that, Stefan. Hey, if there's no more questions, um, again, KK, I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful working with you and your colleagues and exciting to, to see this data. Um, so a partner mm -hmm. project that came out of these discussions, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Dallas Smith, who's an epidemiologist in the mycotic diseases branch at the CDC. Um, and we got connected with him through an interesting series of events, but he's really the, the person who got us connected in with KK and the group in Malawi through his connections that he made when he was in the Peace Corps. Um, and he really initiated a project that he's going to give us an overview on that we worked with through the BSC on some potential pharmacokinetic interactions related to ritonavir-boosted um, COVID-19 treatment. So can turn it over to you, Dallas. Great. Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Looks like everyone can see the right presentation. Perfect. Yeah, great. That's great. Well, Thanks, Dallas. Yeah, of course. No, thank you all for having me today. I'm excited to talk to you about 
as Michelle mentioned, a project that really started with exploring herb drug interactions in Malawi, but transitioning to what's currently going on globally and how can we utilize our knowledge and raise awareness of potential herb drug interactions with emerging, not just diseases, but emerging medications to treat those diseases. And so we Today, I just wanted to talk briefly about a project that we recently completed, um, but it was really looking at, um, we have this very long name up here as our title of our, our article that was recently published, but really looking at um, herb drug interactions with Paxilvid and really looking at herbs that are gonna be present globally because we know that Paxilvid is gonna be increasingly available in, in, in global situations in both high, low and middle income countries. And how can we prepare governments and clinicians um, to use Paxilvid appropriately to save lives um, while also making sure we account for, for herbal medicine use. And so just giving a brief background, I know most of us are very familiar with Paxilvid or Nematravir or Ritonavir at this point, but this medication is strongly recommended for non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And so multiple health bodies across the world recommends it, especially um, to prevent hospitalization to, in order to prevent death. Um, and so I just put up the guidelines that the World Health Organization has, but almost every major health body and um, most governments have recommended Paxilvid um, for the prevention of severe COVID-19. And when we look at, um, of course, like we had the clinical trial data and it looked really great, but what was really interesting was that those data held up in real world situations. Um, and so this was a study that was conducted by the CDC and published in MMWR, but it found that um, Adults were, who took Paxilvid for mild to moderate COVID-19 were 51% less likely to be hospitalized than those who weren't, which is pretty significant. That's a pretty large percentage. And we saw this in multiple studies across the globe. There was some good data coming out of Hong Kong um, during their big wave. And we've seen this um, in mostly all of these world, real world situations. So we know Paxilvid works. It's a great effective treatment to prevent hospitalization and, and death um, in patients with COVID-19. And at the initial start of when Paxilvid got approved and started rolling out, it wasn't readily available, not, including in the United States, but mostly globally. Um, and still today, it's still not readily accessible. But we have seen some initiatives to really start expanding access to this life-saving medication. And um, I think two of the ones I also wanted to briefly talk about was the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, um, which this consortium of individuals kind of worked with the Global Fund, worked with some of these other UN bodies to purchase Paxilvid and start distributing it to governments globally um, who maybe couldn't afford it as it is pretty expensive. The other initiative that is really promising is this COVID treatment quick start consortium. Um, and some of the, the bodies are, the organizations that are working on it is listed below, but this is really starting to pilot and get access to Paxilvid. Um, to low and middle income countries. And these are maybe, they're doing a lot of research around the implementation of Paxilvid. And so this would be some great groups to think about working with um, to see what would be the impact of herbal medicines um, in the context of increasing Paxilvid use. Um, so really great initiatives to get this more available globally, which is a really great thing as we will continue to um, really deal with COVID for, well, I guess forever at this point. However, Paxilvid um, has that ritonavir component, which is a potent inhibitor of cytochrome P450, um, and specifically the 3A component. And this is really good when we think about um, Paxilvid specifically because it's going to be in, it's going to be inhibit um, the breakdown of nematravir, and it's going to actually increase the therapeutic levels in blood which is gonna be more effective um, in order to treat COVID-19. And so the mechanism of action, of course, is, is an integral part of how Paxilvid works. However, because of that inhibition, ritonavir does lead to many, many drug, drug interactions. And these have been highlighted in multiple different resources and multiple studies. And they also have different classifications of these drug drug interactions and maybe what to do. Um, I won't go through all of these, um, but there's usually like, uh, for, for example, the, um, the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines has these major drug drug interactions classified in like four different groups. And I just put two of the groups on the screen, but um, 
for some of these medications, we want to prescribe alternative COVID-19 therapy. So we want to not give Paxlovid. Um, for some other medications, we may just stop the medication um, while Paxlovid is being given. Some other medications, we may need to modify the dose. And then some other medications, we may just need to monitor just to make sure nothing's bad happening. But the one, the thing I wanted to highlight here is that there's really great breakdown of what should be done with almost all these major medications um, when Paxlovid is given. However, when we transition to thinking from drug-drug interactions to herb-drug interactions, only one herb-drug interaction is listed on NIH's COVID-19 treatment guidelines and on the FDA and EMA fact sheets. Um, and this is our typical herb, draw, herb that is implicated in many interactions, uh, St. John's wort. Um, but we know, as a lot of us are pharmacognosists or work with herbal medicine, that this, does, this is, doesn't encompass all the herbal medicines that could be impacted, um, that could impact Paxlovid in the body. And so we wanted to raise awareness of these herb drug interactions. And so we realized that herb drug interactions with Paxlovid or with nematrovir or vertonavir could involve several different pathways. And um, actually this is from our publication and we kind of outlined these major pathways, um, really focusing on the CYP3A4 inhibition um, but also thinking about transporters um, and some other potential other CYP enzymes that are impacted by uh, fritonavir inhibition. And so what we wanted to do, as I mentioned, was that we wanted to create a resource or create awareness to support governments and health protection entities for this increasing global availability of, of nematrovir and fritonavir. And so what we did was that we 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 got together as a group, and I'll go through the group later on, uh, but we wanted to present data on relevant herbal medicines in different regions. Um, and we kind of want to focus on medications that were also promoted as treatments for COVID-19, um, particularly looking at LMICs. We also wanted to look at mechanistic data on herbal medicines to discuss the potential for ritonavir-boosted antiviral protease inhibitor-mediated HDIs, or um, herb drug interactions. and what we really wanted to use this data to raise awareness, but also we also wanted to use this data to promote future studies to really look at the clinical impact of these herb drug interactions. Um, and also we wanted to suggest areas for LMIC focused provider patient communication, which we think is really, really important because we wanna make sure that this data is reaching physicians, patients um, in, a, in a concise way that will really impact care and, and save lives. And so the methodology that we use for our, our review um, is that we focus on CYP3A4 mediated herb interaction. That was our main focus. However, we did expand it to a little bit of other mechanisms, um, including inhibition or induction of um, p protein um, and other transporters. The thing we didn't really discuss in our paper um, was we realized that Paxlovid itself or ritonavir could alter the efficacy or safety of herbal medicine but we decided to really focus on herbal medicine affecting the efficacy or safety of Paxlovid in this paper. And so we identified a list of herbal medicines based on several different things. The first one was expert opinion of the authors who collaborated on this piece. Um, and this was based on local practices and availability in their country or region. Um, we also simultaneously looked at initial data of common use of certain herbal medicines and LMICs, particularly in Africa and Asia. We looked at initial data of promotion um, or use specifically as a treatment for COVID-19. And this could have been within Ministry of Health guidelines. This could have been just um, local use or promotion by local health bodies or just by traditional healers. And then finally, we looked at potential for pharmacokinetic interactions based on available mechanistic data and in some cases, some clinical evidence, although the clinical evidence um, was sparse in a lot of these herbal medications. And so the results uh, was that we ended up identifying 11 different herbal medicines um, and 11 are up on the board. So we looked at aneurographis, we looked at sweet wormwood, licorice, cat's claw, bitter leaf. Um, and these were the 11 that we, we targeted for our review based on the expert opinion of the authors. However, we realized there are many, many more that we could have included. 
Um, but this review wasn't meant to be comprehensive as we wanted to use this review to raise awareness so that local governments, local regions could develop their own list, um, which would be appropriate for their providers and for their public health bodies. And so I'm not going to go through each of these um, each of the uh, herbal medicines that we chose to include in this review, but I just wanted to highlight one just to get an idea of what we did in order to kind of raise awareness and kind of give an example of what other health bodies could do when they're looking at creating a, a list of herbal medicines that could interact with Paxlovid. And so, um, so the one that I wanted to highlight was uh, Andiographis. And we saw that during the COVID-19 pandemic, China, Thailand, and some other countries incorporated this herbal medicine, not just promoted it, but incorporated it into their COVID-19 treatment guidelines. Um, and in some of these countries, they actually added it to their essential medicine list. Um, so it was readily available and it was promoted by the government. Um, but when we looked at um, some in vitro data and in vitro data in particular, we saw that there are potential for interactions, particularly when taken in combination with drugs metabolized by CYP3A4, CYP2C9, and some other CYP enzymes. And this was actually both from an induction and an inhibition perspective. And so two of the studies that we included in our review was that the co-administration of andrographis um, extra extract with naproxen, when taken with naproxen, which and naproxen is a CYP um, 2C9 substrate in humans, it decreased system systemic exposure to naproxen. However, on the other hand, um, we did see that systemic concentrations of drugs metabolized by CYP1A2 increased after co-administration. And so what we kind of concluded or kind of rec or, yeah, concluded was that with the increased use of this herbal medicine during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, mainly due to the incorporation into guidelines and just the awareness that governments raised about its potential use. Um, we believe that herb drug interactions through SIP inhibition or induction are possible. Um, but as you can see, and with many of our herbal medicines being included on this, there was a lack of clinical data. Um, and what does the clinical impact of this, these herb drug interactions actually mean? And so for our discussion, we, we wanted to highlight a few things in our paper. And so the, the biggest one and probably the most important one was that we wanted to recommend or suggest or encourage um, comprehensive resources to be prepared for drug-drug interactions, um, which is really, 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 really readily available currently. But we think that these should include herb-drug interactions. And so two of the resources that I put below um, was that uh, the FDA established a Paxlovid patient eligibility screening checklist tool for prescribers. Um, and it really goes into these interaction codes. It kind of lays out what you should do. But as other resources early on the pandemic, it also did not include herbal medicine rather other than St. John's wort. And then also we have the, the Liverpool, University of Liverpool created a really great COVID-19 drug interaction database. Um, however, it also lacks on including herbal medicines. And so while these two entities, I believe, should include a, a herbal medicine in their interaction checker. Um, we also are encouraging public health bodies and Ministry of Health to consider creating an interaction checklist for their own country and region to make it more specific to herbal medicines that are used in their setting um, as Paxlovid continues to become more globally available. And then the other thing was that kind of taking that translational in vitro data to seeing what is the actual clinical impact of these herb drug interactions. And so we suggested that more research should be done, um, including both prospective and retrospective, retrospective studies for these herb drug interactions. We also suggested you do predictive modeling based on available non-clinical data by applying some established tools um, that could inform HDIs because it is hard to get some of these clinical um, outcomes when an herb drug interaction occurs. And then finally, our, probably our most important um, outcome of this, this paper was that we wanted to raise awareness and furthering the understanding of herb drug interactions. Um, and if we are able to understand these HDI to these herb drug interactions, we may be able to prevent adverse events and potential resistance, especially if, for example, Paxlovid um, is being metabolized too quickly and we don't have enough drug in the body, will that kind of lead to resistance in the future? Um, we also think that raising awareness and, um, and doing it 
increased research can improve patient adherence because they're not having toxicity or some of these side effects from herb drug interactions. And also um, both of these could prevent avoiding failed therapy, which um, is ultimately our ultimate goal from a clinical perspective so that we can prevent morbidity, prevent mortality and save lives. And so that was the presentation I wanted to give, but I wanted to just give a huge shout out to all the collaborators on this piece who are listed um, on this screen. Um, they're from all over the world, which is a really cool to collaborate with them on this piece. Um, and we hope this will be a good resource going forward as Paxlovid continues to, to expand globally, but also just in the future as new therapies get introduced, what can we do from, a, from an herbal medicine perspective to raise awareness um, and provide tools for providers to care for their patients in the context of herbal medicine use. Um, so thanks again for having me today. I um, would love to take any questions and just wanted to give, um, thank the BSC, the Botanical Safety Consortium for having me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dallas. It was a really, really nice overview. Um, and we have a few minutes for questions. Michelle, I don't know if you can see the Q&A, but there was one there. I didn't even know we had a Q&A. Um, but Diana asked if we could elaborate on why these plants were selected. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to take that, Dallas? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think the the plants that we selected really stem from the a lot of our co-authors and their experience and their knowledge of what's available and what's commonly used um, in their settings. And so that's kind of where we we kind of selected these plants from. But as, as I mentioned, there could have, we could have included a hundred different herbal medicines in this paper. Um, but we our goal was just to raise awareness and kind of encourage the adoption of something similar to what we did to specific settings, because we can never cover all the herbal medicines. And so it really stemmed from what were our authors kind of seeing on the ground um, in their specific settings. And then we use that to develop um, this paper. Thanks, Dallas. Yeah, it was a kind of a, a combination, I think, that um, of what's commonly used in some of these more low and middle income countries, particularly Asia and Africa. And then like you said, Dallas, what has been also promoted related to COVID. I see a question from Dan. Go ahead. Well, yeah, and uh, this is Dan. Thanks, Dallas, for the nice talk. A uh, quick question. Uh, does the CDC or uh, you aware is that had any other study or the, the list of the drugs, their uh, um, the interaction with that herb, or oh, this is the only one you have studied? Yeah, this is the only one we've done. And it's kind of a balance of what CDC does versus what FDA does. Um, and so normally FDA does these really scientific and really like in-depth um, papers and interaction checks because they're the ones that really deal with the drugs. I guess from our perspective, from the CDC's perspective and working with the BSC, we wanted to raise awareness of this so that the appropriate authorities both all over the world could really develop these lists and do additional studies um, of herb drug interactions. Uh, have they, uh, yeah, I don't know, I know. Is that anybody or maybe in the CDC, I will think it's important that the vaccine, uh, the, the, uh, the interaction with the herbs, is that touch any knowledge or somebody study? Yeah, that is a great question. And I do not have any knowledge. I'm wondering if um, I know some of our co-authors were on are on this call from the paper, but I know there's also a lot of other people who may have thoughts. Um, so I welcome any thoughts people would like to share on that. Yeah, I'm not aware of any on the vaccine. I, I do know to the previous question that Dan brought up, obviously there's been a lot of work specifically with ritonavir because it's often used for um, antiretroviral treatments, particularly in many, in, in many low and middle income regions. So there's been a bit maybe more studied on ritonavir specifically, but um, so that's where there's a little bit more information on some interactions, but mostly drug drug interactions, not herbal. But I don't have anything that I'm aware of on the vaccines, but maybe something to look into. Diana, did you want to respond to the vaccine question? Or do you have a separate question? I have a separate question. Okay, go ahead. And then there's a couple in the chat that I'll bring up. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. In the paper, you mentioned that this is a non-systematic literature search. 
how did you select the studies that you put in this paper or how were they searched or selected? Yeah, so you're right completely. This is this was a non-systematic um, study. We didn't go through like a prism or some type of like um, comprehensive literature review. And so we really relied going back to the expert opinion of the authors. Um, and we also wanted to highlight different, for example, mechanisms of herb drug interactions, focusing specifically on CYP3A4. And so that was kind of our, our starting point, like looking up studies that involve these herbs and their potential induction or inhibition of CYP3A4. And so that was kind of our starting point. We want to make sure we touched upon that. And so our, our authors kind of did a literature review and compiled information on that. And then as I mentioned, we did just explore to a, a certain degree some other mechanisms of HDIs, including um, PGP, um, inhibition, um, or some other transporters. And so we included information on that if it was available. But to be honest, um, a lot of these herbs didn't have a lot of in vitro and almost no in vivo um, data out there. So although it wasn't comprehensive, we did, I thought, include the majority of papers that were relevant um, to some of these HDIs in, in this paper. Yeah, and I'll just add to that really quickly. I think one of the things that we tried to do is to not go through every single paper and do a full data quality evaluation. What we wanted to really highlight were um, herbs that had potential based on the data that were available. And really like Dallas, you said in your presentation, highlight where additional work might be needed. So we're not saying, you know, the paper wasn't intended to say absolutely this should not be prescribed in combination or taken in combination. It was more to just highlight, hey, there's some things that you might want to watch out for that might be based on available information, things to look into further or things to be aware of. Um, and so then I think that what we're hoping is that this might lead to papers that would do a deeper dive systematic review or lead to more research on some of these plants. KK, I see your hand up. Yes, I, I, okay. So, but we, what, what I wanted to answer, what, I think the Dallas mentioned about it. Uh, I think we started with the, uh, more than what we have presented in the paper. And then thereafter, we, we, we had to screen, uh, depending on the type of uh, inhibition that we explored from literature. So, we had to, uh, we had a cutoff. A point uh, which uh, which was guided by the type of inhibition, as I, I, I mentioned earlier. So that is what we we did, uh, in addition to having the expert opinion uh, for the plant. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, KK. So there's one question from Cyril to Dallas. In, in your capacity with CDC or elsewhere, have you seen uptake or response? related to um, uptake from clinicians and how they might engage with patients on this? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I mean, the reason we developed this was because we wanted governments, we wanted public health bodies to really to kind of address this problem. And unfortunately, I haven't got seen a lot of great response. I think there's just so many priorities with Paxlovid and COVID-19 right now. I think we're entering a season where we're probably gonna see an uptake of cases. We're seeing new variants. And it's hard to get this on people's radar, unfortunately. Um, and I think some of the things we're discussing right now at CDC is um, th these new variants, like how can we better integrate um, COVID-19 into other respiratory care and, and programs and Paxlovid rebound. And that's still on a lot of people's minds coming up. And so unfortunately, there hasn't been a huge uptake from a CDC perspective, um, but I, I hope that... Um, by continuing to raise awareness and talking about this, that we can get this on WHO's radar and um, some of these bigger global health organizations that have a bigger role to play in herbal medicine. Because CDC doesn't have a huge presence in the herbal medicine world, but I know WHO does. And if we can get this on their radar, I think that might be more effective than um, just keeping it domestically focused. Thanks, Dallas. So there was one last question, and then I know we're a little bit overdue for a break. Um, and this was, how would the herb drug interactions compare to food drug interactions like with grapefruit juice and CYP3A4? Um, we didn't dive into that in the paper, but that's obviously something that is also another um, consideration. And I didn't know if anyone involved in the paper had anything they'd like to state related to that. 
we didn't get into sort of relative for lack of a better term magnitude but that's also a consideration now you don't think dallas that grapefruits listed as a for paxlovid i think it was just st john's wort that's correct yeah and there was no food drug interactions listed in those resources either which is another completely different study that's really important that like eventually you mentioned we didn't address in this specific resource yep great question though